Hello everybody, I'm Raphael Perry and it's time to return once again to the Temple of Terror. Now, let's get right in there. So when last we were playing, uh, poor Hero Gervan, who uh, is really not very good in a fight, had taken quite a beating and should probably munch on some rations there for a bit. A few times before I forget. And one more time. And we'll... Wait, if he's only healing two? They are only healing two. Why aren't they healing four? What's going on there? A rations half healing in this book? Also, the character sheet seems to be arranged. I could have sworn the provisions were over here, and the sword is over here, and so these two columns I think were swapped. Anyway, Govan is... he's been lucky, but I've had to use luck in combat, and that is rare. Unfortunately, his combat skill is not... you know, it's not much to talk about. As you can tell from his, his bleeding cut on his cheek there, and his, that might as well be a bandage around his head. Yeah. Well, he may not be successful in this quest, but if that is the case, I'm sure that we'll be able to go right back to the beginning, roll up a new character, and get straight back in there. That being said, we're now aboard the Belladonna, setting sail for foreign sands and far off shores. Let's, uh, let's see how things fare, and hopefully. We'll get a decent episode length before he cacks it. <laughs> you walk around the ship until you find... Yeah, I can't go in. Gargo. He tells you that one of his gunners was killed in a tavern brawl last night and that you will have to take his place. Your job will be to load cannonballs during battle. This is where we remember it is a pirate vessel. You're taken below deck and shown your hammock. Soon the Belladonna sets sail and you are pleased that at last you are heading south. At least and at last. In mid-afternoon there is a sudden shout from a crow's nest. SHIP ON THE STARBOARD BOW! The ship is suddenly bustling with the crew running about their duties. The captain shouts his orders and everybody runs to their battle stations. Wondering who the enemy might be, you take your place at your cannon. You hear the bad news that the enemy is a man of war and not a merchant ship. Noise suddenly erupts all around as the man of war's cannonballs smash into the Belladonna. The order is given to fire, but you realize that the Belladonna is no match for battleship. In the course of the fierce battle, the Belladonna starts to sink and you fear for your life. Test your skill. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, is we deaded? We might be deaded. If so, that was quick. As the ship starts to sink, all the cannon crew run towards the wooden steps that lead to the upper deck. In the mad scramble to escape, you are clubbed on the back of the head. You fall unconscious to the deck and drown aboard the sinking ship. You've fought hard to get as far as you have, but your strength has failed you in the end. Malbordus has no one left to stop him as his reign of terror is about to begin. Alancia has just lost its last protector. Except... I think there's a better protector waiting out there, don't you? Uh, what's going on with these rations? I should check that. Uh, that's, uh, uh, um. Okay. Uh, battle sin. No, not listed. All right. Interesting. No, no, no. Go. Go, we don't need you.
Right. No, we're starting again. And I want to check why rations are only healing two instead of four. But uh, free choice here. No, 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 no. Go normal. Oh, oh, a healthy hero. Uh, you know what? That was great. Is it you? Eh. No, it's not you. Oh well, back in. Surely we can... Where is... Sorry, I'm having a little difficulty here. Uh, other options are... Oh. That was... We get some good skill. Hey, nine! That's not bad. And a bit of luck. Oh, eleven! Right. Now. Gervan again. Um, no object rules on... Where's the options? Um, here we go. Let's see. Let's get a sturdy individual ready to go on a desert adventure. You know what? Yeah, look at that moustache, that's brilliant. Okay, we'll call him... Hanek. Sure. There we go. Oh, no. No. There we are. Panic be the new hero. Uh, we still don't know why our rations are. Can we go back a page? Come on. Game, you're being a bit silly with me. Oh well. Perhaps it was because he was born during a full moon, with wolves howling around his mother's forest hut, but Malbordus' nature was evil. Perhaps it was something more sinister than that, but it is certain that after his mother abandoned him, Malbordus grew up in Darkwood Forest in the care of Darkside Elves. He was taught the elves' wicked ways and also discovered powers of his own. He could make plants wither and die simply by snapping his fingers. He could make animals obey him with his piercing gaze. The elves urged him on and helped him develop his powers so that they could teach him the arcane and evil magic of the ancient elf lords. Magic so vile and powerful that it kills unworthy users. In pursuit of such evil powers, Malbordus grew into manhood. In order to prove to the elves that he was ready to receive the elf lord's knowledge, he first had to pass a test. He was ordered to journey south to the Desert of Skulls to find the lost city of Vartos. In the city were hidden five dragon artifacts which he would have to find and collect. A simple incantation would bring the dragons to life to serve the forces of evil. Malbordus would then instruct them to fly back to Darkwood Forest where a massive army would be assembling. He would receive the ancient powers and lead the hordes of chaos across Alansia in an unstoppable wave of death and destruction. It was only by a stroke, of, a stroke of luck that these terrible plans were discovered. On the edge of Darkwood Forest lived a strange old wizard named Yastra. I'm sure we all know him well. Something of an eccentric. He lived alone in his tower, practicing simple magic and communicating with animals and birds. He was always willing to sell small magic items so that he could afford to have brought to him delicious cakes from all over Alansia. His sweet tooth was the cause of his only link with the outside world as he rarely left his tower. 
It was therefore much to everyone's surprise that he came huffing and puffing into the village of Stonebridge. What could possibly have forced old Yastromo to venture through Darkwood Forest to Stonebridge? All the dwarfs who lived there were eager to find out, and a message was sent to Gillibrand, their king. After the rigours of a recent quest, quite possibly to recover Gillibrand's famous warhammer, you're resting in Stonebridge, enjoying the merry company of the dwarfs. Your wounds are almost healed, and the local blacksmith has honed the blade of your sword as only dwarfs can. Resting on a porch with your feet up on a railing, you're intrigued by the commotion in front of you in the village square. Followed by a throng of inquisitive dwarfs, Yastero climbs the stone steps of Gillibrand's house and is warmly greeted at the top by the king. A crowd falls silent when Gillibrand raises his hand and Yastromo turns to speak. You slide out of your chair and join the crowd to hear what the wizard has to say. With a glum expression, his face almost as long as his beard, Yastromo relates the bad news concerning Malbordus. The dwarfs look up apprehensively as though expecting the five dragons to descend upon them at any moment. He calls on them to show courage, saying, Friends, look on the bright side. At least we were warned of our impending doom, thanks to my pet crow, who overheard the conversation between the Dark Elves and Malbordus. What we must do now is find someone who can reach the Lost City before Malbordus and destroy the dragon artifacts. We need a fearless young warrior who is willing to risk life and limb to save us all. Is there one among you who would volunteer? Each dwarf looks around to see if another has dared to accept the challenge. Standing there watching the worried dwarfs, you realize that there is only one thing you can do. With a wry smile on your face, you raise your arm in the air and offer your services. Yastromo sees you and says, Haven't I seen you somewhere before? Forest of Doom reference. Caverns of the Snow Witch reference. Never mind. You look like the kind of person we want. Make way for our brave adventurer. We must leave for my tower immediately. Come along, let's be off. You have a lot to learn, but I cannot teach you much until we are safely through Darkwood Forest and inside my laboratory. You hardly have time to cram your belongings into your backpack before the important wizard, sorry, impatient wizard, leads you out of the stone bridge towards his tower on the southern edge of Darkwood Forest. Now this particular illustration of Yastromo looks rather more kindly and grandfatherly than his illustration in Titan, the iconic one that most people are familiar with, and some of the later depictions of him as well. I like it. Yeah, there he is. He's, you know, he's looking like, hmm. Actually, facially, he does resemble someone I know. So that, that's an interesting thought. Huh. For an old man, Yastromo is surprisingly sprightly. You cross Red River and the ploughed fields beyond and soon reach the edge of the forest. Yastromo still doesn't stop. He takes a narrow path leading into the dark wall of trees. The light fades, branches and knotted roots obstruct the twisting path and make the walk very tiring. You ask Yastromo why he seems unconcerned at the possibility of being attacked by forest monsters. He chuckles and tells you that his magic is well known and respected by all the creatures for miles around. None would dare challenge Yastromo. After spending a peaceful night in the forest, you reach Yastromo's tower by mid-morning the next day. You follow him up the spiral staircase to a large room at the top of the tower. Shelves, cupboards and cabinets line the walls and are filled with bottles, jars, books, boxes and all manner of strange artifacts. Yastromo slumps down in his old oak chair, by now looking quite tired from the long journey. He reaches into his pocket and pulls out a fragile pair of gold-rimmed spectacles. After placing them on his nose, he peers at you over the top of them and you feel quite unnerved by his piercing gaze. Finally, he says, 
Anybody who would hope to defeat Malhorus must certainly know a little magic. You look bright enough to learn some, but I don't think you have time to absorb the ten spells I would like to teach you. By the way, I would like you to know how privileged you are to learn my magic, but a crisis is a crisis. Now let's get on with it. Which four spells shall I teach you? You think of the task ahead before telling Yastrom on your choice. You only need to take one of each spell as they can be cast multiple times as long as you have the energy to cast them. Well, I would like to take Probably something very similar to before I chose last time. Open door. Jump. In case I fall down some kind of deep pit trap. Read symbols. Detect trap would be really nice. Create water would be really nice. I think we can find water in the desert inside a, a big hollow cactus. But we might miss it completely. So... The Great Water spell would probably be useful. And I think without it we would take a fair bit of damage from the heat. So yes, we'll go create water. Detect trap will just have to be extra careful. Having learned four spells, we'll turn to section 180. If you're a darts player, I'm sure that number means a lot to you. The old wizard looks you solemnly and says, Every minute is vital. We must begin your journey immediately. Without doubt, Malbordus will learn of your mission to thwart him and may send an assassin or two after you. My crow will lead you as far as Catfish River. From there, you can either take a river vessel to Port Black Sand and then a sailing ship south, or journey overland to the Desert of Skulls. A grim task is ahead of you, but our forts will be with you. Yastrum will lead you back down the spiral staircase and out into the open. Suddenly he gives a shrill whistle. A large crow immediately swoops down from the top of the tower and settles on his shoulder. Now, crow, guide our friend as far as Catfish River and make sure you keep a good lookout. The last thing we want is an ambush on our own doorstep. You shake hands of Yastrobo and reassure him that you will destroy the dragons of Vartos before Malbordus can attain his evil goal. And Yastrobo probably mutters, well, you can't do worse about poor Sod Gervan. He smiles and hands you a pouch containing 25 gold pieces, then commands, commands his crow to fly south. As crow squawks and flies off, it's Probably the same crow from Forest of Doom. You hurry after it, turning just once to wave goodbye to old Yastrum. Walking through the tall grass, a shiver runs down your spine at the thought of Malbordus's assassins coming after you. You travel steadily south, only deviating once to circumvent danger spotted by the crow. Three hours later, you arrive at the banks of the Catfish River at a point where it is spanned by a rope bridge. An old barge is moored to a jetty beneath the bridge, and you see several rough-looking characters unloading sacks. You know, this time, I think we'll cross the bridge and go over land. You watch the crow fly back towards Yastromo's tower before stepping onto the rope bridge. The crew of the barge are not concerned by your sudden appearance and continue with their various tasks. After crossing the bridge, you continue south across the scrubland. After an hour or so, you see smoke rising in the east. Um, so here's my thought, right? The journey down river is relatively safe until we get to Port Black Sand. Then we get on the ship, which is incredibly dangerous and quite possibly fatal. So I'm trying the overland route instead, which will be equally fraught with danger. However, smoke rising in the east, we can explore carefully. You soon discover that the smoke is rising from the burning roof of a wooden hut. Two dark elves in their familiar black hooded cloaks are firing flaming arrows at the hut. Suddenly a man appears at the door, forced out by the choking smoke. Armed with a sword and a shield, you watch him run towards his attackers. 
Before you can help, he is cut down by two arrows. The Dark Elves step out from behind cover and walk towards their dead victim. We could attack them or say, not my problem. You know what? I will attack them. Because if I leave and they notice me and trail me and send reports back, then that's bad news for me. We don't want Malbordus' assassins knowing where I might be. You draw your sword and run towards the murderous Dark Elves. Time to fight! Okay, this first one, we're rolling at plus four. And I'm just going to do a quick uh, check. Alright, that music is very loud. I'll have to speak even louder. Wallop! And again! Gotcha! The second Pogue stands up to take his place. We're rolling at plus three, pretty good odds. Mm, just. I was making free gift the other way. Yeah, we're good. I'll take a draw. Ooh, yep, that's great. I'm. Um, look, it's. Well. Oh. <laughs> Hanek has little need of luck in combat. His skill is fairly effective. That combat music's loud. Um, can I turn that down ever so slightly? General... I can't turn the combat music down separately. I'll just turn the overall music down a bit. Uh, sound a little as well. And we'll hope that works. You find two gold pieces among the elves' belongings, and you take one of their bows and two remaining arrows. Hey, a bow and two arrows could be very useful in the future. After burying the poor man who was killed by the elves, you set off south again. Although the scrubland is quite barren, you are surprised to see a patch of ground which is totally black. Is it a tarn? There is a smell of decay in the air which appears to be coming from a black patch. Holding your nose, you walk over to inspect the patch and see that there is a bronze medallion lying in its center with the letter M deeply etched into it. Could the medallion have been dropped accidentally by Malbordus? If so, in the center of a black patch of dead ground, this feels like a trap. I should not touch that. I will leave that lying where it is and walk on south. The day wears on and you make good progress over the flat scrubland. When it is finally too dark to walk any further, you find shelter in a cluster of boulders. Let's try not to roll a one. Hooray, I did not roll a one. The night passes without incident. You wake at dawn feeling refreshed. You regain two stamina points. Well, fortunately we hadn't lost any. You sling your backpack onto your shoulders and set off again. Up ahead in the sky, you see something flying towards you. As it gets closer, you see that it is a creature with the body of a large bird of prey, but the upper torso of a woman. It's a harpy! It begins to emit a piercing shriek, which you instantly recognize. You frantically plug your ears with cloth that you can that you rip from your shirt, so as not to hear the mesmerizing call of a dreaded harpy. I cannot cast a magic arrow spell, but I do have a bow and two arrows, which I apparently cannot use at this time. Otherwise, you must fight the harpy with your sword. Very well. The vicious harpy swoops down to attack with its razor-sharp claws. Well, we'll have to hope the fighting music isn't too overpowering. Uh, 9 on 8, we're only at plus 1. Meaning... Ah, she's only got 5 stamina. We don't need luck on this one.
All good. And I'm recognizing the triumph sound there from Tin Man Games. Excellent. Um, Warlock of Firetop Mountain adaptation that feels more like a board game. Which is ironic given the fact that there actually was a Warlock of Firetop Mountain back in, board game back in the day. Which was actually quite fun to play. I, I bizarrely enough have two copies. Because the first copy I got had something it was missing the rule book and it was missing one or two other things and the second copy has everything that's in good condition i think the first copy isn't around anymore i'd have to go check but if you win you set off south again keeping a watchful eye out for other hostile creatures as you walk along a leather pouch suddenly drops out of the sky onto the ground in front of you you open the pouch and find a note inside written by Yastrum. It says, Friend, I have learned of bad news. Malbordus is already ahead of you, but look up, for help is at hand to enable you to catch up. Obeying his instruction, you look up and at first think another harpy is above you, but then you see that it is a giant eagle gliding through the air. The eagle circles above you and then lands of effortless ease close by. I remember, I remember things... Pleased that old Yastromo is concerned for your life, you climb onto the back of the eagle. You are soon riding through the air, traveling directly towards the Desert of Skulls. There's going to be fire elementals or something, isn't there? Or, or Jin? Wait, hang on. There's Jin, Jan, and Ifrit. Ifrit's are the fire ones, aren't they? Yes. However, your good fortune is quickly brought to an end when you hear an ominous screeching above you. Like a giant diving gannet, a hideous pterodactyle swoops down to attack the eagle. That's pterodactyl, pterodactyl. It is tile, isn't it? And then pteranodon for the other one. Yeah. Hmm. If you're carrying a bow and arrow, I am! The diving pterodactyl is a difficult target to aim when you aim to hit and you aim carefully before releasing the arrow. Your skill is reduced by three, which means. It's no cliff racer from Morrowind. Do you remember those cliff racers? They just like hover over you for ages when you stand there going, I don't even have a ranged weapon. Please just calm down so we can fight. <laughs> All right. Not expecting... Oh, your beauty. The arrow hits its large target, but does not kill the pterodactyle. It squawks and turns again, but Biden dives down to attack again. You know what? I've got a second arrow, and I don't think I'm going to get many other opportunities to use it. Sure. As you reach into your backpack for another arrow, the eagle climbs steeply into the sky to outmaneuver the pterodactyl. You grab its feathers and stop yourself from falling off its back, and in doing so, drop your bow. You watch it spiralling down to the ground, and now you can do nothing more than await the outcome of the battle about to commence. So basically, that's saying this was completely irrelevant, and they're going to fight anyway. You draw your sword and try to help the eagle in its desperate fight, but the pterodactyl stays out of reach, and you are unable to influence the outcome of a bloody battle of beaks and talons too much. Your giant eagle mount has 6 skill points and 11 stamina points and will be reflected on your adventure sheet for this battle. Awesome! Well, the eagle has to fight, doesn't it? Go on, fight music. Please don't drown me out this time, eh? Good, good. Not gonna complain. You tear into that prehistoric monstrosity. Uh oh. Okay. I mean, much like Hanik himself, we're relying on stamina over skill to see us through the battle. We're not going to use luck on that.
Uh, if the pterodactyl wins, I think we might have fallen into the sea and been in a similar drowning situation to abandoning the Belladonna. However, the eagle wins the aerial battle. Seizing the pterodactyl in its sharp talons, the eagle tears at its neck with its sharp, curved beak. The pterodactyl's death squawk grows fainter as the huge flying reptile plummets to the ground like a stone. You hear the valiant, you cheer the valiant eagle as it continues to fly south and indeed hear its wing beats, I should imagine. After flying over Whitewater River, the terrain becomes gradually more arid. When you at last reach the edge of the desert, the eagle flies down to land. It is dusk and the eagle does not intend to fly into the desert. You dismount and look around for a place to shelter and opt for a hollow in the crusty sand. You awake soon after dawn, but it is heartened to find that the eagle has flown off home. You stare out into the desert landscape and see nothing but barren sand. Wondering what fate will befall you in the wilderness, you start the long walk south. As the sun rises, it quickly becomes uncomfortably hot. By noon, your mouth is parched and your thirst is unbearable. You know what, we've had some pretty hot weather here the last few days. If you're able to cast a create water spell, absolutely. Now, I'm thinking that soon... Does this go back and... No, it doesn't. Okay, the diamonds do not help. I'm thinking that this will be a... Uh, this won't be the exact same place we'd get if we washed up on shore after the shipwreck of the Belladonna. But I'm, I can't remember how far off it is. But yes, we will cast our create water spell. You cup your hands together and say the words of the Create Water spell. Water suddenly fills your palms and you gulp it down in long, delicious mouthfuls. The afternoon sun continues to beat down relentlessly, its intensity causing shimmering waves of heat to rise from the parched, uh, parched sand. When you have finally drunk your fill, you separate your hands to stop the flow of water and press on across the desert. A spell well used, I believe. Oh, look at this classic illustration. It's beautiful. You walk by the dry white skeleton of some large unknown creature and notice the corner of a wooden box jutting out of the sand inside the ribcage of the dead beast. I'm absolutely going to dig this out. There might be a snake in there. Why am I thinking there might be a snake in there from memory? I'm thinking it because of the snake in the treasure box in is it Midnight Rogue or oh no 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 it's um Warlock of Firetop Mountain go in turn left room at the corner side room it's one it's one of those two rooms isn't it we might be okay Inside the wooden box you find a mirror and a sealed clay pot. You place the mirror in your backpack and decide what to do with the clay pot. C can I can I take it without breaking it? I think that would be rather wise. Um, I'm feeling it's full of liquid. I will break it open. You know, first time doing this in years. It's not quite a live dangerously motto so much as a, I want to find out what's going to happen. Oh. You crack the clay pot open with the hilt of your sword and are surprised by the hissing sound of gas escaping. The box is a looted treasure chest, but the bandits did not fall for the trap that was left inside it. Your head is engulfed in a cloud of poisonous gas which you cannot avoid inhaling. You lose six stamina points and one skill point. That skill point is going to really hurt. So I'm going to eat some provisions. Yeah, provisions are only healing two. Why are they not healing four? That is very, very odd. I'm going to have to check another book to see if provisions just heal two in this book as opposed to the usual four, but we're still alive. For over an hour, you lie unconscious on the desert ground. That is not good. Oh, we were lucky. Barely. So then we don't get robbed or captured by slavers or something nasty. 
When you wake up, you feel terribly weak, but the thought that Malbordus may now be ahead of you brings you to your feet. With grim determination, you stagger on south, with no idea what kind of horrible thing could have happened if we were unlucky. You have walked for only about an hour when the sun begins to set. The flat desert sand offers no shelter and you are forced to sleep out in the open. The night passes without incident and you are soon on your way again. By mid-morning your thirst is great and you long for a drink of water. You search around and suddenly see a bulbous green plant covered in sharp spikes looking like a small round cactus. So this is our water without the create water spell option. It only happens once, so all the other times we get thirsty in the desert would be taxing. Let's go with the spell because it's reliable for now. You cup your hands together and chant the spell. Water fills your hands and you gulp it down. When you have drunk all you want, you separate your hands and press on south. Oh, hello, monster. That's a monster if ever I saw one. Look at those long grabby arms like a gecko or something. Walking steadily south, you are unaware of the unseen danger in front of you. Your right foot sinks into the sand and you feel a sharp pain as something begins to tear at the flesh on your leg. You stab your sword into the sand as a sand snapper tries to overcome you. It shudders and the sand is shaken off its brown body to reveal its gaping maw crammed with cutting teeth. It is impossible to penetrate the thick scales covering its hide. Some of the scales are suddenly pushed apart by two long tentacles which try to grab you and pull you into the sand snapper's mouth. Oh, have they fought like separate foes? Ignoring the pain in your leg, you begin to hack at the tough tentacles. If either of the two tentacles wins two consecutive rounds during this fight, you will become restrained and unable to fight back. We don't want that, obviously. Oh, we're fighting them one at a time as well? Alright then. Only plus one. Okay, we take the damage. Oh, we are dead. That's really bad. The tentacles outmaneuvered your strikes and managed to restrain you. That's really bad. The struggle is over. Both your arms become entwined by the sand snapper's tentacles. Slowly you are dragged into the gaping moor to be slowly digested. Your adventure comes to a horrific end. That is truly unfortunate. Well, I'm thinking next time we'll have a new hero who probably won't be anywhere near as good as the last one we just lost. But hey, don't worry, I'm going to keep on playing. I hope you guys have enjoyed this uh, episode, uh, disastrous though its end may be, and I'll look forward to seeing you all in the next one. I'm going to say goodbye for now though, and cheerio everyone! <laughs>